Hello, Harry. How's it going? Hey, man. How's it going? You good? I'm doing all right, thanks. How are you? I'm all right, man. I'm in the sun next to the beach in the Atlantic Forest, so I'm pretty, pretty good considering COVID. Oh, uh, that just sounds absolutely wonderful. I've always wanted to visit the Atlantic Forest. It is. Like, I got here and I kind of did a few things during, like, my first few days to acclimatize man i just came from seattle so it's freezing cold and then coming here to like really hot and then i needed to buy a few things so i spent like two days kind of just like chilling out and then the first day i went to the the forest i found like a bow throps like within 10 minutes that and is then, like, awesome yeah. and then my second snake was another bow throps and then third <laughs> snake was a dipsus fourth snake was a whip snake fifth snake was another bow throps now, for people who don't know, could you please quickly explain what a Bothrops is? Bothrops is a lance head, um, very uh, venomous snake in South America, probably one of the most feared snakes actually in South America um, and in Central America as well. Uh, it's, uh, it, I think in Brazil, there's at least 20 species of Bothrops. So it's, it's uh, obviously in quite a few places. So therefore it, it gets under quite a lot of people's feet but it's one of the one of the most scariest venomous snakes i've handled because they're just so unpredictable their the venom is just very powerful as well like i know a lot of people around here who are petrified of them because they've actually been bitten just working in their farms or you know walking or going to a stream or going swimming on the weekends and then they walk barefoot on a rock and they get hit so Ooh. uh yeah it's it's a beautiful snake but it's very feared in this part of the world yeah, I've always wanted to see one. I've somehow managed to like see two Bushmasters, but not like a single Bothrops. And I don't know how that happened. Like, yeah, Bushmaster, probably one of my favorite snakes in South America, as well as um, the Bothrops bilineata, the, the, uh, the palm viper. I've, oh, yeah, well, yeah. I've seen two of them on the same palm once. It was, that is unbelievable. Incredible. Really? Smiling. Yeah. Wow. It's pretty awesome. Huh. Does, do, do, would, do you think there's like some kind of indication then there's some kind of like pair bonding like you see in a lot of other animals like birds or well humans? Uh, I don't know really. Like when I saw that, I've only ever seen them two snakes together once. Um, and it was after a really, really hot day. There was a small sprinkling of rain and we went on this night walk and we didn't see nothing like we were just like right that's it let's go home we haven't even seen like three or four frogs you know and just as we kind of like turn around we look into this kind of like open section and then we just see like the bright kind of emerald green like shining back at us. oh we like, yeah yeah right. we go over there and then it's just like they're just both sat on the same palm like just within two feet of each other and absolutely just amazing snakes Oh yeah, they they look absolutely incredible. I've always wanted to see one. They're just the the colors and the scale patterns. It's just beautiful. Hundred mm, percent. I I don't really understand people who are like see snakes as like these ugly, scary looking creatures. Like I think they're just probably the most beautiful group of animals alive today. It's all in education, isn't it? Like. When I was in Ecuador, I found a uh, Cyphlophus compressus, which is basically like a red vine snake. Um, and I, it's, it's known as a false coral. It has like a really bright head and then it has like red and black patterning going down its, its body. So when I first like showed a few of the local people, uh, adults and children, they like instantly ran. They didn't want to go near it. They were like, no, this is scary. It's going to kill you. It's going to. And then when they saw it in my hands, they were a bit more curious. And then I eventually got like at least 80% of the kids to actually come close to it. And a few of them actually held it. Um, and it just shows that it's, it's education. You know, if you know something scary, like a shark, for example, and you're swimming in the ocean and a shark swims past you, you're going to be scared because you don't know how that shark's going to act, you know. But when you are actually in the ocean, with a shark you know that you shouldn't really be scared of it because you know you're in its area you're in its its world and it's just curious you know kind of a bad kind of comparison 
but I'm just saying that a shark is scary, but it's not dangerous, you know? Like a snake for some people can be scary, but that's just because they don't understand it. I think I think it's a perfectly good comparison. I mean, they're both completely misunderstood organisms that people just generally fear for what ultimately are irrational reasons. Yeah, I agree. Um, I understand, like, if you've been bit by a venomous snake in the past, how you can't have that kind of fear. But, uh, yeah, trying to teach people in South America about kind of, like, the respect for snakes is a difficult thing, but I feel like I'm getting somewhere. Currently, I'm making like a, a field guide um, because the Atlantic Forest, Mata Atlantica, has not got hardly any kind of like research done on it for reptiles and amphibians. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, like if you look up online, you try and find stuff, all of the books are just like years, years old. Um, the deforestation, which happens in Brazil, is actually, you know, destroying a lot of habitats and therefore making some of the snakes and frogs around here and lizards extinct you know like we don't know what's mm. in these forests i've come here not knowing what i'm gonna find which is you know is exciting that's like the most the, exciting thing in the world yeah <laughs> but at the same time it's like if i see something i'm gonna grab it i don't know what it is and the other night i grabbed a um a leptodiria and now the only other leptodiria that i've ever handled was the leptodiria annulata and it did exactly the same thing it was a different coloration completely but as soon as i picked it up the head flattened it's false viper it kind of flattened to the kind of like triangular shape um and i all instantly knew like what it was but because it was a different coloration it, you know if it was any other person that has a little bit less experience than me, they would probably be a little bit more kind of like skeptical or confused. Um, but I guess, you know, spending, you know, six years in the rainforest, um, you know, spending time in Australia, spending even more time in the Ecuadorian rainforest, you know, like it's, I've, I've kind of built up a kind of my own uh, kind of field guide in my head, so. I'm, uh, I'm doing a field guide now just for future herpetologists or people who are interested. And I'm also trying to do my own kind of field guide on uh, mimics for the mm. locals. I want to do oh, a field okay. guide for the locals so they can see venomous compared to non-venomous. I want to do it in Portuguese so that these guys can kind of understand it. I want to give it out free to the local people because that's how, you know, education, if I'm doing it free, they hopefully they can see my passion and hopefully my passion can change the views of some people because the other day I was, I was walking um, and I saw this uh, bird lance was probably about a meter, just over a meter. And someone had just stuck a stick through its head, oh. you know, like it, you know, this snake was probably about six years old and it, it just been killed just because it was in the wrong place at the wrong time. But if I can, educate people on what's venomous and what's non-venomous what to do with both of them but ideally i just want to tell them just to walk around it but if that's not the option then i want to just i want to kind of just you know expand their knowledge so they know that they can just kind of you know with respect and with time they can save these animals and in turn they can save diseases from rodents and and other you know things which are controlled by these snakes so has there been like kind of any recorded outbreaks of diseases from a decline in snake populations? There hasn't really been, uh, from what I personally know, I haven't really done much research on it, but there hasn't really been much of that. But I know that in communities, a lot of the people kill all the snakes. Now, in turn, when there's a small community with, uh, with um, leftover food and, and other bits and pieces kind of that draws in rodents, you know, it draws in pests. The snakes would have obviously eliminated them, but because they've killed all of them, that's a huge problem now. So what they do instead is they say, well, we have a huge rat problem. We're gonna bring in dogs and we're gonna bring in cats. We're not gonna feed these animals, these domesticated animals. These dogs are gonna be sick. They're gonna be, you know, mm. malnourished. They're gonna then try and eat the rats. So they kind of like eliminating one 
animal to then bring in other animals which aren't native to then destroy the problem which if they hadn't have done if they hadn't killed the snake in the first place this problem would have happened and i'm so, assuming these solutions aren't working out very well for them no of course not no it's it's tragic and when you bring in dogs and cats people get bitten people get you know they've got mange they've got fleas they've got ticks they've got um that so there's a there's a thing called a sand flea which buries itself into the bottom of the paws of the cats and the dogs in in communities where there's sand this will bury its eggs into the the paw it will then you know get to a point of where it's super i've had them in my feet from being in communities it gets Ooh. fiery itchy so these dogs and these cats literally just like bite their feet off to try and get this irritant out. Oh my God. Um, and, and it causes like infections and maggots and it's, it's horrible, but the people also get it. So it's like, well, you know, these dogs are bringing them into the community because of there's so many of them. So it's like, well, there's many, many things which happen if you kill snakes. It's not just, it's not just, you know, I killed a snake and that's it. It's like, it's a, it's a population control type thing, you know? Yeah. You, you alter the entire ecosystem when you take something out of it. Yeah. And this, 100%. this is one thing I've often found frustrating is I know a lot of like kind of restorationists and rewilders and everything who want to put in an animal that is similar to something that was gone from an environment in its place and i've always thought this doesn't work for exactly the reasons you're describing they because they're just like you know someone would say oh mastodon are extinct from a certain area let's just bring in african elephants but it's like just because they have a similar ecological function does not make them the same animal like sure dogs mm -hmm. and cats they'll, they'll be eating the mice and everything but as you've just brilliantly pointed out it's just it's not working like the snakes are because the snakes, you know, they've been part of this ecosystem for millions of years. They've been evolving alongside everything else. They are very much a part of it. And when you bring in something yeah. that isn't a part of it, it's just going to have completely unintended effects. Yeah. And a lot of these snakes aren't even venomous. You know, a lot of these snakes don't even eat the rodents. A lot of these snakes are just, you know, small kind of like very placid colubrids. And yet they still get mixed up fused with, the venomous ones and you know in turn they just end up killing every single snake that they see because they just don't know how to identify it so that's what i'm hoping to do here is is make a guide for the locals and also make a guide for people who want to come and travel and visit the atlantic forest like yourself um so that you can easily id something you know it's taken me hours and hours and hours you know of, of going out of collecting of photographing of you know separating of ideeing it's 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 hard but i'm enjoying it so far yeah it sounds horrible <laughs> <laughs> well, if, I get, if i get stressed i just go to the beach which is like 200 meters that way so <laughs> oh that's awesome uh so what what would you say is like any could you point out like any major differences between the atlantic forest and the amazon because when i just kind of picture the amazon i picture is this just this giant expanse going across you know, all of North and South America, but I, I guess I'm wrong when I picture it that way. Uh, okay, so uh, from what I have seen, the sections that I have been to is, is like an uphill slope, you know, it's like mountainous. Hmm. There's huge rocks everywhere. There isn't big streams, obviously there's no like huge rivers. Um, and it's, it's like a very different kind of climate it, obviously you've got like the the wind coming in from the ocean but it's the rainfall here it is heavier um there's there's a whole bunch of differences honestly mate uh but yeah it's for me personally it's the uphill struggle of like climbing basically these mountains to try and find things but you know these these fertile ants they love it so it's kind of good for me and good for them and since this sounds like it's kind of an environment that's much more difficult for humans to access than kind of a flatter terrain so i would imagine that has left a lot of these animal populations more intact compared to you know other parts of the amazon um to, kind of but 
because it runs along the coast, it has a lot more kind of human interference. So the other day, unfortunately, I found a dead ocelot. Um, oh. I don't know how it died 100%, but when I was looking through the kind of like bones, there was plastic in the kind of like body. So from what I'm guessing is, because the forest that I've been in, I found maybe one or two bits of plastic, maybe. And I've walked quite a bit of it. So it's not a dirty area. But what I feel is that the animals, because it's so close to the coast, the animals, they come down at the nighttime. They, they root through the rubbish. Uh, and unfortunately, that kind of, you know, being close, they get hit by cars. Being close, they eat stuff they shouldn't, like plastic. Um, and then obviously, if people are here and they have chickens, they get into the coops and, and then and then get killed, snakes, ocelots, you know, like all, all of the animals here. So I feel like the, the, the great thing about the Amazon is that it's so big that, you know, deep inside it where no one, you know, ventures is this kind of like ecosystem of just wonder and beautiful. And, you know, it's like- It's unbelievable. It really yeah, is. Like, you can't go there because it's just so hard to get to whereas here the atlantic forest is huge but a massive portion of it is is contacted by people and people are especially in brazil because of the government and and the no kind of regulation on on deforestation has is definitely had an impact 100 mm. percent interesting yeah, no, that's 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 very upsetting, and I would imagine like a lot of ocean currents would probably be bringing in all that plastic from like, you know, all the way from like up here, from like you know the eastern seaboard of North America, like you know that just bring it all down. So it's like you know it can now just be dispersed to areas that you know it would have never touched initially. A hundred percent. Yeah, I agree. And you know, it's like some of this plastic that could be here could be like you said from you know the eastern coast of of america and you know you could just put your rubbish in the bin and it just gets kind of like tipped out somewhere like you know where where does our rubbish really go where, where does the, our recycling really go you know i've heard that like three percent of our recycling actually gets recycled you know and it's like it just makes you think you know what we as humans are doing to this world we we really are kind of like destroying it in a way like even if it's like not even a malicious way maliciously cutting down a forest is is different but just putting a crisp packet into the bin it's like well where does that go what does that affect how does that affect an ecosystem what is that doing to animals not in your country but in different countries for example toothpaste um tubes a lot of them get sent to different countries in southeast asia and people root through them, but you know, like people are sending rubbish all over the world just to, to what you know. It's a big question in my head at the minute, especially after finding that dead ocelot. Awesome hmm. It's almost as if constantly sending out materials in the world that will last ten times your lifespan is unsustainable. Hundred <laughs> percent. It's. Uh, Who could have guessed? You know, it's it's what what a what a shocking and unexpected twist. But it's just horrible. Eh? It's horrible it's, to see it for a you know. Yeah, I can't even imagine what it must have been like to find that. I would have just probably just like fucking cried or something. Like that just sounds horrible. Yeah, no, it's it's not nice, especially with my background um and my connection with ocelots. But at the same time, I can't can't do anything about it. It's in the past, you know. And if I dwell on the negatives, then I'm just gonna constantly be upset with life because this world is a constant disappointment. But if I don't kind of focus on the negatives and I go out every night and I try and find different snakes and then, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, trying to focus on the positives, you know? Yeah. Speaking of your background and connection with ocelots, can you please explain your background and connection with ocelots? Because, you know, you've told me your story and I think it is truly inspiring. Yeah, so um, in 2012, uh, I was actually in Afghanistan and um, 
I was there at the age of 18 and definitely was a place I didn't need or want to be. It was not the best time of my life. Uh, I didn't get paid very much, a lot of money. Um, I was doing it because I was young and naive and um, I just feel like war is, is just for money. You know, it sucks. So anyway, after Afghanistan, my mental health was extremely bad. I was suicidal. Um, I was drinking far too much alcohol. I was just being a horrible person. You know, I, I didn't mean to be. It's just kind of a way that I was dealing with it. So I ended up just saying, fuck it. I stopped drinking. I went, I, I looked online actually and went to a organization in Peru called Fauna Forever. And I went to the jungle for one month. I went there with bad intentions. I went there to kind of like uh, end my life and kind of get be done with this world. But then when I was there, I think it was like the, the second weekend I was fishing uh, for dinner and the kind of like night was changing. It was like from the birds in the evening to the bats at the night time. And I just had this kind of like feeling in, inside myself, like, dude, what the fuck am I doing? You know, like, this is beautiful. I want to be here. So anyway, my month was up. My return flight was there. I went home. I got a job. Um, it was summer in England, which is it's beautiful in England. I was working, I was with my friends, I was happy, I was content. And then winter came in and I was just absolutely miserable again. I was just like, what am I doing? Why am I here? What is the purpose of me being in England? What am I doing? At least it wasn't Wales. <laughs> At least it wasn't <laughs> Wales, even though Wales does have some great scenery. Yeah, but, but they also never see like, the sun. Never. <laughs> well, or Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Mordor. Um, it's just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd be as I'd be as white as Holly, Holly O'Donnell. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I just I just said fuck it. I packed up all my things. I sold everything: my car, my television, even a pair of shoes. And I just went back to the jungle. Um, I kind of stayed there for for a long time actually uh and I was focusing on snakes and I was focusing on like a bunch of other stuff and then uh Khan came to my life which was a young ocelot and I spent you know months and months with him being with him walking with him teaching him feeding him you know like catching animals for him and, and, and just being how did you first encounter Khan someone told us about him in a local community uh, and we basically went up there and argued with these people for hours just so that we could have him. They wanted us to pay $200 and they wanted us mm. to do all these things, but, you know, paying for a wild animal is fueling the fire in the black market and trafficking kind of roads. So obviously we said no, and we argued and argued and argued, and eventually we we managed to get him back and, I just decided that, you know, this was my time. This is why I came to the jungle. I needed to be here for some reason. Maybe it was to stop me from killing myself. Maybe it was to stop me from being sad, which, you know, worked occasionally. And then when he arrived and he slept in my hammock with me to keep warm and when he, like, cried and I fed him, and you know, I would realised at that point this is what I needed to do. So I stayed with him for months and months and we walked every single night uh unfortunately on one night we went out um there was a poacher's trap put out in the jungle that I did not know about and I walked off trail with him and I walked back onto the trail and he came running towards me and I must have been a meter away from this and all of a sudden the the trap went off and shot him straight in the shoulder um blowing his arm almost completely off oh, and um, one of the most horrible things you know i've been to afghanistan and i've seen people die people being shot in the head i've seen young kids dead but when you spend so much time with something whether it's be a human whether it be an ocelot it doesn't make it any easier you know so when yeah. he died in my arms it was 
kind of like a turning point like what am I doing again you know depression was definitely a scary point at that at that time because it was just like I'd lost my son I'd lost my only thing that I really really cared about um, obviously I cared about my family and I cared about my friends but you know when you dedicate almost a year of your life to something not you know become nocturnal become a, a hunter yourself go hungry for days because you're out with him you know like try it you know it's raining and raining and raining you need him to eat so you don't eat and then he dies because of human that that's you know heartbreaking so yeah. after that I left. Um, I went to America for a short amount of time. I went to England for a short amount of time. Then I flew to Australia. I needed to get away. I needed to get to somewhere wild. So I went to Australia and I lived in the outback for six months and I caught reptiles. I saw amazing, you know, animals. I saw amazing landscapes. I went swimming in in kind of like amazing kind of like lagoons and I saw, you know, massive massive saltwater crocodiles and freshies and just i tried to just you know get this negativity that was in my head from losing calm out of my mind but something inside me was like missing you know something was just like what is going on so i ended up going back to peru um and at the time it was kind of like uh, i didn't know what i was doing but just as I was about to leave, Keanu came into my life. Same thing, same, you know, he was in the community. People wanted us to buy, buy him, you know, argued again, got him in my life. And then I spent, you know, 14 months with him. Just everything. Khan was my teacher, you know. Khan taught me everything that I needed to know to do what I needed to do with Keanu. And I spent months months and months with him you know just being out in the in, in the forest and um filming him for a documentary that uh we're currently making at the minute um and just photographing him and understanding him and during the days we'd go and lay underneath these big ironwood trees just resting and mm. in the night we'd go out and we'd catch snakes and we'd catch frogs and we'd catch rodents and we'd chase after different animals and it was like you know, I was, I became an ocelot. Like I saw life through the eyes of an ocelot. That's, that is incredible. Like Harry, was, the, the sheer was will and determination you have, it's, it's truly inspiring. Like, yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's, for me, it's natural. I can't be in a city, you know, at the minute I'm staying in this small town in Brazil which is lovely. It's great. I, I'm doing something, but every day and every night I'm in that forest. It's nice to come back to a shower. It's nice to come back to, you know, some Wi-Fi so I can contact my girlfriend and contact my family and friends. It's nice to have that, but this is not where I'm meant to be. I'm meant to be in the wild. Um, and when I am in wild places and I can't get out for hours or days or months, that's fine. That's fine with me. You know, that I, I excel when I'm in them places. Here I'm doing a completely different project, but at the same time, you know, I'm spending as much as I can in the jungle. Um, but my determination came so naturally to me because it's, it's what needed to be done at the end of the day. If that hadn't been done, he would have been declawed. His teeth would have been, you know, ground down so that when he was angry at people, um you know chained up or locked up somewhere he wouldn't actually injure them i've got scars all over my body from where his natural teeth and his natural claws ripped into me and you know injured me and just you know hurt me but if i'm meant to be his mum, he would have been messing about like that with his mum. but you know were, were you got... not worried about cat scratch no i i was just like you know what if if I get scratched by him and I get like blood poisoning or if I get scratched by him and I get sick, that's meant to be. Fuck it. I don't care. <laughs> because no, this is what great I'm attitude. Doing. Yeah. Like if I'm being all delicate and fragile with a wild cat, yeah, I had cuts on my hands which got infected, of course, because I'm in the jungle. The humidity alone is gonna mess with you. The you know, the bacteria, you know, everything's gonna mess with you, but 
That's what I had to do. That's my purpose. And I loved it, you know. The mosquitoes killed me. I've got over, I've had over 70 bot flies. I've had dengue twice. I've had leishmaniasis. I have been in absolute dire state from diarrhea and vomiting and giardia and just completely being exhausted with dehydration, everything. But I'm here, Anna, you know? Like Yes, you I, are. <laughs> I put I put my all into something when I want to, like this, you know. Brazil at the minute is frantic COVID. I didn't Yeah, yeah. I heard they're like hospital systems like on the verge of collapse right now. Like it's awful here at the minute. But I'm spending my time in the jungle, you know. And I'm coming to these places when the people are kind of like settling down. They're not really doing much. They're kind of quarantining, but they're not at the same time. But it's not as frantic as it would be. And I'm using that opportunity to travel here and to get to the places of where people aren't going to be so that I can do the research and the projects that I want to do. It's hard, you know. Yeah, do yeah. Do money out of my own pocket. Uh, you know, like I've set up a Patreon account and, you know, I get paid a little bit through that. But that's my only income. And it's pretty good because the Brazilian real at the minute is so... Is so good with the you know conversion of the British pound that I'm I'm not really struggling here and I'm just kind of doing a project I want to do. But uh, yeah, after you know my projects with Oslos, like Keanu was eventually successful and he went into the jungle and currently we don't know where he is. He could be in a completely different area, pushed out by another male. He could have swam across the river and gone to a different location. He could also be dead, you know, that is part of nature. As long as he spread his seed in a few females, then I'll be happy about that. But, um, you know, it's like he was successful and that was extremely, I was extremely proud of myself for that. Yeah, no, um, that's amazing. Yeah. So it took some time and it took some dedication, but, you know, like at the end, if you just put your mind to it, you know, everything kind of does pay off, so... I remember I was there was one thing you were telling me that I found really interesting where, where you tried to put like a tracking collar on him, if I'm not mistaken, and it like yeah. just completely altered his behavior. It was, you know, if you look at big lions and stuff in Africa and they have the collars on them, it looks okay. It, it looks as if, yeah, it's a bit chunky, but it's not going to alter them too much. Because the rainforest canopy is so thick, it needs, you know, more battery, more GPS, more everything, you know, um, to, to track it. So I put this collar on him and it just was not going to work. It was um, to some degree inhumane. And he made me definitely think about other animals that have been, you know, monitored and tracked, even put in kind of like... Uh, GPS kind of tags in snakes and caiman or, you know, putting collars on lions and, and tigers and cheetahs. But with smaller cats, definitely wouldn't work. That's... He was scared. He couldn't clean himself properly. He couldn't hunt properly. This would have been the demise of him, you know. This would have killed him because I wanted to see how well he was doing. That, nature that should be does nature, seem... You know? Oh, sorry. No, no, that's okay. Um, that does seem to throw the results of like a ton of different like zoological behavioral studies into question because it's like, yeah, just doing this one thing just seemed to completely change his life. And I can't imagine like, you know, if you're doing that with jaguar or lions or any other kind of cat or just any, as you mentioned, caiman or any other kind of animal, it's like, yeah. Well, what I, I knew this animal before the collar and I knew this animal with the collar. Okay, a lot of people, they go out, they dart a lynx or something like that, like a, a smaller cat, they put a collar on it, they let it wake up, dizzy as hell, where the hell am I, with this thing on my neck, how does that compromise the animal? Yeah, it really does, I think, throw a lot of what would be considered accepted fact about these animals' behavior into question, if this is the methodology we're using to figure that out, because it's like, yeah, we're, we're, we're yeah, as you said, it's like, like yeah, what the hell happened it's like i know we want to do research i know we want to do more things as scientists we want to 
figure out why animals do things or how they do things or when they're most active. And with cats like ocelots, it's not easy to figure them things out, you know, because they're nocturnal, because they are fast, camouflage, very, very intelligent animals. I understand the, the want to do these things, but at the same time, sometimes I just feel like science ruins ruins what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I feel like if, you know, like there's easy ways of doing stuff and there's hard ways of doing stuff. If you want the easy way, you go and dart a cat, you go and put a collar on it, you know, you get the permits, you go do that. That's the easy way of doing it. If you want the hard way, you spend your life understanding these animals, you know, in captivity, in the wild, like, you understand the animal by being in the animal's natural behavior. Camera traps are a great thing. You can see a lot on camera traps. Being in the jungle is a great thing because I've seen many things. I know that I am a bit biased because I have had two ocelots, which I have seen doing wild things, but at the same time, they're doing wild things. I've also seen other wild animals doing wild things, and I haven't disturb them at all i've just sat there quietly i don't wear bug repellent so they can't smell me i don't you know i carry very light things nothing that clinks or dinks or anything like that the only thing i have really with me which is kind of metal is my machete so that then if i'm stuck in an area i can kind of clear it but when you you know sit and you dive into the deep end of of the jungle of the forests you don't really have to kind of you don't have to put an animal out to to understand them fully you know hmm. yeah that's that is absolutely fascinating and yeah th this is kind of a trouble um i've i've had with a lot of conservation projects i've seen where the interference is either a affecting the results or even worse is actually making the situation with a particular animal they're studying even worse um you know like i i've i've come to realize that like you know just catching an animal alone can be completely traumatic for them as you mentioned before and i think you know seeing with these studies with wolves and everything and how fear can alter an ecolo the, the ecological function of an animal it's like i'm like wondering like what a lot of projects if they're actually like altering the ecology of this animal after they catch enough individuals like yeah yeah and you know it's there's there's just there's so many questions you know i could talk for days about about this sort of thing um but there's a there's definitely a lot of questions that i have in my mind that i want to figure out myself yeah there's there's a lot of things that i'm doing right now and i have done in the past which you know, could contribute to to science, could, you know, help, you know, someone with a paper or an article or something like that. What um, kind of but, questions are you interested in pursuing? For example, one of them um, with, with, you know, ocelots is um, with deforestation, with communities coming in and cutting down places, uh, you know, like what effect does that have on on the mental health of an of an animal? Mm. I feel like, okay, us humans, me and you both have been depressed. Okay. Oh yes. <laughs> we, we have struggled with suicidal thoughts, depression, everything. But we are in. We have a shower. We have a toilet. We have food we, that can be refrigerated. We have internet that we can talk. Imagine if 80% of the stuff that we had got eliminated. Imagine if all our, if, if our fridge went, if we couldn't shower, we had to go to a stream all the time. Yes, to, for me, I enjoy that life, but to the average person, do they, do they enjoy that? You know, All think... of this to humans isn't natural, really. I think 
people have to be inoculated to it. I think I think we we have almost evolved to not be used to this kind of thing. I think, but the thing yeah. is, I think it's kind of like dogs, you know, where it's like you know, dogs can just in a lifetime go from domesticated to feral, like they're wolves back in the wild in just a lifetime. Right. So I think I think anyone can be inoculated to that particular type of lifestyle. But... Or if you're a wild animal and deforestation happens and you have had, like Khan and Keanu, your offspring taken from you and you have had, or you've been shot at or you've been trapped in, in a cage that people have put out pigs and then they let it go. How does that affect the mental health of an animal? We're not the only ones who struggle with mental health. Look at elephants with PTSD. Look at, you know, dogs that have been beaten all their life. Look how sad and scared and frightened and agile and fragile they are, you know? Like, how, do, how does the effect on the rainforest affect the mental health of the animals? It's not even yeah. just mammals that have these kinds of issues too. I remember reading this very interesting um, article that was, I don't remember exactly when it was written, but at the Smithsonian National Zoo in their reptile house, they had um, some species of turtle, I don't quite remember. Um, and the, the turtle was essentially engaging in self-harm and it's only when they put in objects for it to interact with and play with essentially, then the turtle stopped engaging in that behavior. It was basically more mentally healthy. Yeah, and the same with uh, snake rescuers. You know, if you if you have a snake in your house, you call someone to to get it, which is a good idea because if you don't know the snake and you don't know if it's dangerous or not, you don't really want to be messing with it. And people all around the world do this in in, in many countries where there are a lot of venomous snakes. If you take a snake from that area and you take it kilometers away to release it, that snake will die probably. 80% of the time it'll probably die because it doesn't have a uh, an area to return to. It doesn't have scent trail. It doesn't know the area. It gets so stressed out that it doesn't um, it doesn't eat properly. It doesn't know where the closest water source is. It's GPS and and you know its natural kind of coordinates in its head are, are completely you know they're gone. It's a completely new area. It's like me dropping you off in a different area and you not knowing anything, you not having any help, any guidance. And so you're not doing this for the record. I just want to make sure you're not going to just show up and like take me to like Minneapolis or something. Just be clear, <laughs> right? Just pick you up like a sim and drop you off. Somewhere. <laughs> but no, but this is the thing, you know, if you do catch a snake and you want to photograph it and you want to make a guide, I, I think that's great. But you need to put that snake back in the exact same place that you found it, the exact same place within the meter, you know, it's, it's so very important that, you know, animals are, uh, are treated with respect. And a lot of the time, some of them are just not, it's hard when there's a snake in a house, it's either going to die by being killed or it's going to die by being put somewhere else. But the chances of it living in the wild are a little bit more higher than in a, a built up area in India, for example, where the, the, the people living there, they're very respectful to animals, but there's a lot of cars, there's a lot of bikes, there's a lot of hectic craziness going on. And if an animal, like a snake, for example, tries to just cross a road, it's gonna get killed. But if it's in the forest, it's, it's got more of a chance, you know? That's, that's been devastating for, for viper populations around here, um, especially as infrastructure continues to get built. It's like, I have been seeing throughout my life less and less vipers um especially considering they're just so slow moving but they're also like one of the biggest rodent predators out there so it's really very harmful to the ecosystem as a whole 100 percent, yeah definitely and uh like my life basically revolves around snakes if anyone asks me oh where are you going next like there's got to be at least a few snakes in that country that i need to kind of go to you know <laughs> so yeah <laughs> it's it's definitely something which I care about a lot. Um, obviously, the ocelots were, you know, uh, something that I just loved. It was my life, you know, for that small section, and I loved them to pieces. Um, and, you know, but for some reason, for me, snakes, uh, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that the snakes which are left are, are going to be as safe as possible. That's, that's my goal. 
that's very noble of you and yeah no it's it's they as i've said before they're just the most beautiful animals i think alive today um if i if there were living dinosaurs i'd probably say those are the most beautiful but unfortunately there's not any as of yet i'm gonna try to fix that but <laughs> yeah no i think i think snakes are are just truly wonderful and I'm, I'm glad you're out there looking out for them um you you mentioned earlier um you have this documentary uh coming out um i'm very excited for it but uh could you tell us a bit more about it yeah so um when khan was about i was filming small sections of him just for my kind of general i just i just wanted to i just wanted to remember him uh so i've got some like cool footage him you know hunting and him kind of like with me and us walking and and then uh i met uh trevor frost who you know yes i do know and, trevor and uh we started talking about you know a documentary and how it can be this could be something we can make a short, you know, I didn't really have too much footage. I had a few photos and I had maybe 280, 300 gigabytes of footage, something like that. So it was just kind of like small things and we could possibly make it into like a small documentary about how, you know, like Khan, I came to the jungle because Sad and Khan came into my life and I'm helping the jungle as the jungle helped me type thing. Um, so we kind of was like, yeah, let's just do a small documentary. It'll be kind of cool. I want Khan to be known, you know, as he died in such a horrible way. Let's do this. And a few weeks after that is when Keanu came about. So the cameras came in, the hard drives came in in plentiful amounts. Um, and because of that, Trevor and Melissa then decided to come, you know, as often as they could, every two months or every month it would be. And I filmed Keanu as much as I possibly could. You know, like I, we have terabytes of footage just of wow. Keanu. And then this became not only just about the ocelots, but about, you know, kind of like mental health and about, you know, problems that the jungle is facing and, you know, the forest fires that are happening in the, in South America every year are getting worse and worse and worse. And animal trafficking is also increasing and deforestation is also increasing. And so now it's not just going to be like a seven or eight minute short film. This is going to be like an hour and 15 film, like a full length feature documentary. Um, and it's going to be about how animals and how, how, how we help the animals, but how animals help us and how the forest is so important. Yeah. Um, it, it's, I have to say it is going to make you cry. Yeah, it's you... gonna make you sad it's gonna make you think twice about you know the way that you live and about what this forest is and if you don't cry there's something wrong with you <laughs> <laughs> when you were describing con to me i was like really trying to have to like hold the tears back so i'm i don't know if i'm ready for this movie um quick question will godzilla be in it a lot of my favorite <laughs> movies have godzilla in. um <laughs> There's going to be a few big caiman, which Keanu definitely uh, definitely doesn't really see or is very curious about, and he almost gets whammed by one. So that's the, <laughs> that's the closest thing that you're going to get. But no, it's a very, you know, the cinematography that I've been, you know, trying to put into it. The filming that Melissa and Trevor have done has been absolutely incredible. Trevor uh, has an eye for photography, so I, I'm sure it's going to be absolutely phenomenal. Like... And have you met Melissa? I have not met Melissa. One of the most incredible people. She is a great filmmaker, a great editor. She and Trevor are very, very good together because their eyes for, you know, for specific things, for like focusing on, you know, on a, a point, you know, you could film something, but what's the point of filming it? You know, they have like that pinpoint on it. And, um, you know, I'm, very very proud of both of them for for getting onto this you know documentary and helping us because it's like it's one of the thing where you know they brought on some great people you know this film isn't just going to be a short this film is going to be you know like a million dollar documentary which is unbelievable to think about it's a lot of money to put into a documentary you know but i said 
when Khan was dying, this, don't worry. I said, don't worry. I am going to make sure that you are remembered, you know? And this film, that's it. That's, that's what's going to make him remembered, you know? I'm continuing to talk to podcasts and to, you know, to you and YouTube channels and BBC and The Guardian. After the documentary comes out, I'm hoping that I can still continue to spread my, you know, my awareness and my knowledge and, and my story. Um, I want to eventually write a book as well about my kind of like adventures and lifestyles in the jungle and the stuff that I've been through and seen. And, you know, there's, I'm never, ever going to let him be forgotten. That's the one thing, you know, I got him tattooed on my throat for a reason. It's not because I don't really care about what people think of me. I don't, but it's not because of that. It's because I want him to always be seen. And I want his story to always be heard. I find that just absolutely incredible, Harry. And, you know, I think what you're doing is just just fantastic. Um, you know, it's truly inspirational. Um, actually, you mentioned your tattoo. I did I did want to show um, want you to show this off. We're both, of course, big Lord of the Rings fans. And you have <laughs> the coolest you tattoo. <laughs> yeah. Can you please share share the Lord of the Rings tattoo with us? Um, because I put this picture on for a reason. My girlfriend thinks it's great. <laughs> <laughs> God damn your own. <laughs> well, I know. I'm, I'm an evil bastard. I have one orc, two orc, one elf. The mama kill. I have the mountains in the background. And then inside my armpit, I have the Nazgul. That that is insanely badass i fucking love it like <laughs> well you know if you love something and you are in a job which kind of allows you to do whatever you want you know it makes you happy and i enjoy getting tattooed they, they they make me feel good they make me feel happy so it's just one of the things you know like if you love something just fucking do it if you love the ocelots go into the jungle and do it if you love snakes educate people so they don't get killed you know like do whatever makes you happy. And, and that's kind of how I'm living my life these days. Yeah, it's it's absolutely fantastic. And these, um, where was I going to go with this? Um, oh my God, my brain completely blanked. Never mind. Oh yeah, now I remember. Um, yeah, I think there there is like this this certain appeal of like Lord of the Rings to a lot of very naturey people. Like, you know, most naturey people I know, like, you know, Lord of the Rings is like one of their favorite books. Like it really, and I think it may no, have. It's a different world, you know, it's a, it's a world in which we wish we could live in. Uh, you, you, that's how I feel. And, you know, like, I feel like, Yes, there was war. Yes, there was problems. Yes, there was tragedy. But, you know, at the same time, if you lived in, uh, I don't know, if you lived in the Shire, for example, that would be a very nice life. I think for me, it, it is sort of, it almost gives me a sense of hope because, you know, the, the world of Middle Earth, I think, is in many ways very reflective of our world, even though it has like wizards and stuff. Um, and the re I, I say that because it's like, you know, all the bad guys in Lord of the Rings are really doing all the things the bad guys in real life are doing. You know, they're, they're just creating industry that's ravaging the planet. They're starting wars. They're just destroying lives left, right, and center. And I think Lord of the Rings is a story about kind of hope in the face of these problems. And that in turn, I think, can kind of provide a lot of hope for people who are kind of very engaged with these issues. Yeah, I agree. And I also agree that, you know, you said that there's wizards and you said that there's, you know, if you've ever met a shaman, you will understand mm. that shamanism and spiritualism is definitely kind of on that same similar level. I've heard uh, stories, but I've never met one myself. You should definitely try out ayahuasca with a, an actual shaman. I know a very good one in Ecuador. Um, it's it's life changing, man. It's it's absolutely crazy and it makes you definitely feel happier it makes you definitely feel better about everything and it kind of gives you this kind of like sense that there is hope you know hmm wow that sounds incredible uh, i'm actually reading yeah, a oh sorry uh, no ayahuasca is crazy it's, it's absolutely crazy 
I'm actually reading a book about it right now um, called Rational Mysticism, and it's it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, I don't read. <laughs> I can't read very well. <laughs> That's but, fine. Uh, yeah, yeah. I spend a lot of my time when I have with kind of naked people talking about these types of things, and the stories that I hear are just, you know, for example, this shaman, when COVID hit, everyone in the community has got COVID, and he went out, he got three different barks from three different trees, he fermented them he gave them to every single person and no one died and then within two days everyone was there wow you know how does that work how he, he's got such <laughs> an understanding of the forest he knows stuff he's seen stuff like that's that's, that's a, you know the forest we're cutting down the forest for for what reason you know but in yeah. there is all for everything the amount of medicines it could offer us, I think, you know, is really cannot be understated. Like, I think it could just completely revolutionize, well, medicine. I mean, in fact, like most of our medicines come from the Amazon. Like, yeah, it's, it's incredible. It's just another reason not to cut down the forest, though. Yeah, no, well, yeah, it's just, yeah. And it's just beyond tragic, um, you know, it, to think that, you know, someone could just right now be bulldozing a cure for cancer. Like, it really yeah. is just so upsetting. Um, yeah. So do you have any idea when this um, when this documentary is going to be out or where we can see it? Is, is, is it going to have like a limited theatrical run if theaters ever open again? So we're hoping that next year in January, it will be in Sundance Film Festival. Oh, that would um, be amazing. Yeah, we're hoping anyway. And um, it should be done by the end of this year. But, you know, when it's done, then we're going to be putting it out. It's different kind of like who wants to buy it or who wants to, you know, help us with it. And to be honest, right now, I don't know where it's going to be shown. I don't know what's going to happen. I just know that we're doing the best that we can with COVID and with everything. So it's going to be a spectacular film nonetheless. But it's going to be... Um, it's going to be a few months until I actually understand fully and know fully where it's going to be shown, but I'll keep you updated, dude. Yeah, no, I'm, I am super excited to watch it. I think it's going to be absolutely amazing. Um, Thank you. So I'm, um, where was going? So do you, do you plan to do any kind of other cat reintroductions at any other point? Um, do you plan to raise any more um, wild animals and reintroduce them? I never really plan anything. Um, I, things happen for a reason. I am in the right place at the right time. Sometimes, sometimes I'm not. So if a cat needs my help, I'll be there for it. Um, if a dog needs my help, I'll be there for it. If a giant anteater or, you know, something is in need because of human, you know, destruction, I'll do everything I can. Um, so I know that for the rest of my life, I'm going to be helping animals. I'm going to be, you know, a, a voice for the voiceless. I'm going to be uh, an educator and, and hopefully be, you know, reintroducing and helping as many animals as I can. Um, that's just kind of like how, that's just what I need. That's what, that's what I have to do to survive, you know. And so I don't have a plan on, on it. But if it happens, it happens, and I'll be there. And Anteater would be just fucking amazing. Yeah, no, definitely. It would be pretty tricky. Um, I know Paul Rosalie obviously had one. Oh, yeah, was, he did, yeah. Yeah, and he said that it was just one of the most phenomenal kind of experiences that he had ever kind of been involved in. Um, and it's just one of the things, you know, like, you become so much more connected with nature when you become a part of nature. Um, and yeah, so giant antics would be cool. Uh, but who knows what's going to happen next? You know, I, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen tonight. So we'll see. Yeah, no, it's, it's really, yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I also love about the jungle is the unpredictability of it. Like, you know, just, the stumbling upon like the most amazing things. Like it, it's always nice to see something. What happened to my camera? My camera keeps dying in the middle of these things. It's annoying, but, oh, damn it. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just, 
that that I think is really for me the biggest appeal of the jungle is that you know not only do you see the most astonishing things but they happen at seemingly the most random times um like i remember seeing like like a bushmaster that was like three and a half meters long and that is up to this day the coolest thing i've ever seen and yeah i never thought i'd get to see that <laughs> like <laughs> yeah but seeing a bushmaster i've seen a few in my life and Man, they are just a phenomenal, phenomenal snake. And nothing can really compare to kind of like just stumbling across one of them. Yeah. I'm trying to think, like, what would you say is like been your best wildlife encounter? Like the coolest thing you have ever seen? <sighs> I saw a harp eagle take a monkey out of a tree. Whoa. I've seen... Uh, a saltwater crocodile take a bat from flying low. A Holy fruit bat. shit. Um, I've been stalked by a puma for about 20 minutes. And Whoa. just kind of like having that them eyes on you, you know, was really, really incredible. Um, I've seen a coral snake uh, being eaten by a mazarana. Wow. Man, there's so many. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's there's too many to to count. But with Keanu and Karnas, I actually saw Keanu um, running after a Tyra across the canopy of the trees for at least thirty minutes. You know, just like cool, the two Tyras cool into each other, and he was going up and down these trees, running after them. Absolutely spectacular. So, yeah, I've I've seen some. I've seen some pretty cool stuff in my life, which I'm very fortunate for. Uh, that sounds absolutely incredible. I can't even like imagine what that must have been like to see, you know, especially um, especially the harpy eagle take the monkey out. Yeah, I, I, in my life I've seen five harpy eagles, and every single time I've seen one, it's just been like, you know, it makes you it makes you take a deep breath and think like how how lucky you are to actually be able to put your eyes and lay your own eyes onto something so spectacularly powerful and magnificent. I, I saw one with Paul and that was really just one hell of an experience. And then we were next to a stream and there was like an anaconda in the stream. Well, there was like a harpy eagle above us. And that was, yeah, either that or the Bushmaster has been like the greatest moment of my life so far. Like just absolutely amazing. And the jungle continue to give we give it the chance you know yeah i think one thing i've noticed and i've heard people who've had similar experiences and i'd like to hear your take on this um is the more you want to see something in the jungle the less likely you're to see it oh 100 if you go out looking for something or if you go out with the you know like if you're a tourist and you're like i want to see a jack yeah like Unless you're on the Pantanal, uh, unless you've been, you know, surrounded by someone who knows exactly where it is, you're not going to see it. Um, if you if you go out and you're just, like, grateful for the fact that you're in the forest, you know, like, who knows what you can see. My girlfriend went to the, the rainforest and she had the intention of just seeing what she came across. And one time she was driving up river to see me and a giant anteater swam across the river, you know, and <laughs> like, people can sometimes get lucky. Uh, Trevor, I remember was driving to Lucerna to come and film me and he had to stop for some reason. I don't know why. And a short eared dog just walked across the road. straight. In front oh, of me. wow. And, you know, it's just like, he was just going and he was just driving the car and just had to stop to go for a piss or something and then bam short eared dog i have and been so lucky enough to see one anteater in my whole life um where i didn't even know what it was at first until i saw someone else's video of it like weeks later because it was so yeah. far off in the distance and it just looked like this like old carpet just kind of lumbering through the undergrowth yeah, yeah i've then, seen a few and every time i see them they're just incredible yeah, absolutely astonishing. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Thank you so no. much for coming, Harry. It's been nothing short of a pleasure. Well, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, good speaking to you again, man. Uh, we'll have to catch up soon. Um, and I'll keep you updated on what's happening in Brazil and especially with the documentary. Please do.
All right, man. We'll take it easy. Thank you very much. You too.